All right, cool. Let's get to the runtime then. Anything else before we start with runtime? Okay, cool. So, yeah, as I said, the runtime is uh, about the runtime itself. Um, we won't talk about build aspects or distribution or, conta or container orchestration. And the idea is, but it's very, I mean, it's very loose to, to talk about a single node runtime and not talk about distributed ones. But I mean, I, 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 I won't blame people if they extend a little bit out of that, but hopefully they don't. And uh, I didn't start my five minutes timer because I'm already finished. So um, that's pretty neat. Okay, cool. And all the speakers will feel free until I'm I'm getting very like you have, we have a little bit relaxed time constraints now. So I'm stepping up from my dictatorship <laughs> a little bit until further notice, of course. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Akihiro Star from NTT Corporation. I'm a maintainer of uh, Mobi, which is typically known as Docker, and also maintainer of Container D. Uh, so in this talk, I will uh, talk about rootless Docker D, uh, which means. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I think I zoomed in somehow. Oh. We can use this. Oh, thanks. Uh, so uh, rootless Docker D uh, means uh, running Docker demo and uh, also. Uh, of course, containers as a non root user on the host. Uh, of course, this is not about using uh, sudo. And also, it's different from uh, adding a Linux user to uh, a user group named Docker, uh, because uh, this is uh, equivalent of uh, giving the full privilege to the user uh, via slash bar slash run slash docker.soc, uh, which is an API socket for connecting to the uh, privileged Docker daemon. It's also different from uh, Docker run dash user and uh, Docker D dash user NS remap, uh, which still uh, leaves the demo running at the root on the host. And the root Docker D uh, has been available uh, in Docker since uh, version 19.03, and you can get the uh, installer for the root Docker D from uh, get.docker.com slash rootless. Uh, the <coughs> original motivation of uh, rootless mode uh, was for cloud native environments uh, rather than HPC environments. Uh, so the initial motivation was to uh, mitigate uh, potential vulnerability of uh, container runtimes, uh, I mean Docker, and also orchestrators such as Kubernetes. But uh, it turned out to be useful for HPC environments as well. Uh, because in HPC environments, uh, users want to uh, install software without asking the admins and other means uh, don't want to uh, break other users' environments. And uh, rootless mode uh, is uh, implemented uh, using uh, user namespaces, uh, which is a Linux kernel feature that allows a uh, non root user uh, to pretend to be the uh, root user. Uh, so, uh, with user namespace, uh, an unprivileged user can have a fake URD zero and also uh, create other namespaces, such as mount namespaces and network namespaces. Uh, so uh, this is, is uh, very similar to how singularity works uh, with uh, dash dash user NS. But unlike singularity dash dash user NS, uh, we support unsharing uh, network namespaces. Unsharing uh, network, network namespaces is very important, even if uh, you are not interested in uh, separating TCP IP TCP IP network, uh, because uh, without uh, sharing network namespaces, uh, it's possible to uh, break containers uh, via abstract leak sockets. And uh, for ensuring network namespaces, uh, we support uh, both uh, user mode uh, NAT and real kernel mode NAT uh, with uh, security binary. So user mode NAT is uh, Completely unprivileged and very safe, but uh, it has uh, performance overhead. Uh, so for HPC environments, probably you want to use a uh, set URD binary called LXC user unique uh, from LXC, LXC project to uh, ensure network namespace uh, with a real uh, kernel mode NAT. And to use uh, the user namespaces, uh, you need to configure uh, the file called SRAS, etc. SRAS sub URD and sub ZRD. 
Uh, the file has uh, three fields like this. Uh, the, U, the UID of the user and the uh, UID of uh, sub-users and the numbers of uh, sub-users. Uh, sub-users is a concept of uh, uh, putting user accounts uh, into a user account uh, so you, you can be uh, another user while you are being a user. Uh, so in this example, uh, the UID uh, 1001 is uh, mapped to zero, uh, fake root is a user namespace, and the UID uh, 100000 uh, is mapped to one, and UID uh, 165535 is uh, mapped to uh, 65536 uh, in the namespace. Uh, so in, inside the namespace, uh, you just have uh, six... Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, six five five three, uh, six sub users, uh, but this should be uh, enough for uh, most of container images. Uh, but uh, it's uh, very uh, difficult to uh, configure a sub UID file and sub GID file in LDAP and Active Directory environments. Uh, so we are uh, discussing on uh, adding some kind of NSS module, so you don't need to uh, have a static configuration file like etc thrust sub UID and etc sub GRD. And alternatively, uh, it's also possible to run uh, continuous uh, wizard uh, mapping sub users. Uh, so uh, we can use uh, instead PTRS and X attributes for uh, emulating uh, sub users. Uh, this is uh, very similar to how uh, your Docker works, uh, but Pitress is very slow, so you will uh, have uh, performance overhead uh, two times or uh, five times or even more. Uh, but in future, probably you, you, you could use a uh, second for acceleration, but it's currently uh, not stable at this moment. And uh, we also run uh, C group country. Uh, that means uh, you can't control uh, CPU quota and memory quota for uh, each of uh, containers. Uh, in future, uh, we could use uh, C group version 2 uh, for delegating uh, C group permissions to unprivileged users. Uh, but the migration from C group v1 to uh, C group v2 is uh, likely to take a uh, uh, few years uh, because uh, you can't uh, use C group 1 controllers and C group 2 uh, controllers. Uh, without uh, change, changing the uh, kernel configuration. Uh, so, I, I mean, uh, you can't use C group 1 and C group 2 simultaneously. Uh, even for C group V1, uh, we could use a uh, PAM module uh, called the PAM CZFS for uh, switch on and switch modding uh, C group 5 system. Uh, but currently, uh, this PAM CZFS is not available in Fedora and uh, Red Hat Linux uh, because of uh, security concern. And uh, the root stroke uh, is uh, also uh, vulnerable, uh, is uh, still uh, weak against uh, kernel vulnerabilities or uh, VM vulnerabilities or hardware vulnerabilities. Uh, so I think uh, root stroke is still not suitable for uh, real multi tenancy uh, where you can't uh, trust other users. But probably uh, we could use uh, GBrowser, uh, which is, is uh, Google's. Uh, user mode implementation of Linux kernel. Uh, so we, maybe we can use ZBrowser for uh, mitigating uh, some of these kernel and VM and hardware vulnerabilities. That's all of my talk, thanks. Okay, cool. <coughs> Next up is Valentin. Here you go. Thanks. The mic's there. Yeah. Now you can hear me perfect. <laughs> so now I'm going to talk a little bit about, about Podman. Podman is a container runtime, although we prefer calling it an engine because runtime is already a pretty overloaded uh, term because there is RunC, GVisor, and all the tools that implement the OCI runtime spec. So Podman is basically a container engine. It can be best compared to Docker. And in many cases, 
it is meant to be a replacement for Docker. There are features that have been added um, and some features that have not been implemented, but I will be talking about them in a bit. So also the CLI of Podman is based on the Docker one. Why? Because it's a de facto standard CLI for managing containers. So every user of containers is, or I claim that every user of containers is familiar with the Docker CLI, so it made no sense to introduce yet another interface that users have uh, to get used to. And also from an automate, uh, automation perspective, it made sense. So tools that already exist don't have to migrate. They can just replace or alias it. Everything is developed on github.com, containers, Lipod, and it shares with the other tools I will present later, the image and storage library, and it also uses parts of builder's code for the podman build command to basically support building Docker files. Recently, a lot of work, um, at least from my side, has been going on in the image part to optimize it, especially for performance. So when we compared builder speed to Docker, we realized that basically pushing and pulling was the big bottleneck. Because at that time, pulling and pushing each layer has been serialized, which mm, was basically the biggest uh, the biggest uh, improvement we made by just parallelizing everything and now luckily we are we are faster which was nice for us and somehow surprising because the architecture of podman is inherently different Regarding CLI compatibility, to illustrate it a bit more, Podman run is basically the same as a Docker run. We use some image that can be specified and some commands here just listing the root file system of the latest Fedora image. The easiest transition from Docker to Podman is basically aliasing it. And on a package level, this happened basically in Fedora as well. Some of the commands, as I've mentioned before, are Docker only. The biggest one may be Swarm. Why? Basically because there's no interest from the up upstream community. The, the de facto standard uh, orchestration, at least to our belief, is Kubernetes and implementing yet another thing on top is just work that um, where we don't have time for. Some of the community uh, are actually working on that, which is really great, so we're entirely open to integrate anything that uh, the community wants, but we just don't have the time or the interest uh, investing it from our side. Um, another uh, command might be container update. Um, because this can be replaced by a container removal and then creating a new one. However, there is a lot of work going on in extending the CLI. Parts of, uh, or just to mention a few of it, I don't have time to get into uh, all the details, is health checks, so Podman health check, which basically periodically runs commands inside the containers to see if the services are still running, because a running container doesn't mean that it's healthy, meaning that the services inside are running as, as expected. Um, Podman supports pods, that's basically where the name comes from. Podman stands for short pod manager, so the Kubernetes pod concept which, for instance, can be created via Podman uh, pod create. Podman also eats a Kubernetes YAML file, which is nice because it allows for an easy transition from the developer machine up to the orchestrator and the vice versa, um, which um, requires the pod concept to be implemented. It also supports mounting the container root file system, which I will illustrate later also in the bullet talk. And one really cool feature that a colleague of Akihiro uh, contributed is Podman imagery for printing the layer hierarchy of an image in, an, in a tree format. 
Portman ABC. So Portman supports rootless containers since day one, which is under the same conditions as um, Akihiro explained before. So some people claim, well, rootless is not really rootless because you still need root to allocate a range uh, for the sub UIDs and sub GIDs. But that's as far as we can get, at least at the moment. There's a lot of work going on in, in the SECOM domain. Akihiro mentioned that on the slides. But we're just not there yet. And a lot of discussions are happening upstream. As you can imagine, everybody has an opinion on that. So it will take a while until we converge. It's not running as a daemon. And this is the biggest difference to Docker. It uses a traditional fork exec model, which in this case improves security quite a bit because it has a reduced attack, uh, attack surface and the vector is way, um, way smaller. It adheres to the Linux security models and parts of it is also it allows audit logging. So when you use Docker, a user does something on the system, it will always be locked under the same user because Docker D runs as root. And it allows to cover additional use cases. Currently, we're working on a remote client for Linux, Windows, and Mac OS to also, I see quite a bunch of Mac users here. So you can already use it. Soon it will be stable. It's implemented via varlink, varlink.org. There you can find the more information about it. It's basically an interface description language and transport layer. It has bindings for C, Go, Python, Java, Rust, Bash, and the Lipod API or the Podman API also allows to interface from that. So you can write automation tools that directly interface to the API, Varlink API of Podman. For instance, the Cockpit project uses this uh, to manage containers directly in the browser. The clear focus is on standards. In this case, the Open Container Initiative, OCI, we're contributing um, a lot with them and, all re and parts are also overlapping maintainership. And Portman shares the components with the sibling projects, Cryo, Builder, and Scopio. Right in the intro slides, I was talking about the interoperability and compatibility. You can find resources um, upstream if you want to check out the code. It's on github.com containers lipod. Feel free to, chain, uh, to join the Portman channel at Freenode. Since two weeks, we now have a Portman mailing list also. There's a blog on portman.io. If you want to check out demos that you can also run on uh, your system, it's basically a glorified set of bash scripts that we also use in the talks. You can find them on containers, demos, and it's available on most Linux di distributions. So certainly on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Fedora, it's also an OpenSUSE. Um, some of the SUSE folks are planning to also um, support it in the enterprise. In the enterprise version, it's on Manjaro, uh, Manjaro Gentoo, Arch Linux, Ubuntu, and also Debian. I, I guess you get the message. And that's pretty much it. Happy to ask any, to answer any questions you have. Question and answers at the end. <laughs> Sorry. Who, who's next? Uh, I think it's Michael. No, no, it's on. Let me talk again. Now it's on, yeah. OK. Cool. So singularity container runtime, right? Uh, I was born out of a necessity, right? Users were coming to Greg, and they were saying, hey, we want to run containers in HPC. Uh, actually, really, they came in three and a half, four years ago, and they said, we want to run Docker in HPC. Um, so we set out to solve essentially the problem that, that the two previous speakers were sort of talking about. Um, running containers rootless or with, with as little use of root as possible, uh, doing it with a traditional fork exec model so it fits within the right context uh, for a uh, resource manager like Slurm so that it can be run in this HPC, HPC shared environment. Um, so some kind of interesting stats, we're, we're seeing millions of container runs per day with Singularity. Uh, on the WLCG, the worldwide LHC computing grid, they're running over a million uh, jobs on Singularity every single day as well. 
40,000 users, millions of cores. We're supporting x86, ARM, uh, power PC as well. We've won a couple HPC wire awards. All these fine folks are using Singularity Runtime. So the privilege model that we, we really like to talk about is that you're the same user inside the container as you are outside the container. So when you're running Singularity, uh, in the default mode of operation, we're really not trying to make it appear like you're running uh, in a VM as a root user really on your own system because you want access to the underlying resources on the machine. Uh, you want to really feel like you're actually running on this HPC machine. You just want to be able to isolate and take your software stack with you. So all your libraries and, and you know Python or whatever you have is working as expected. Uh, and that, that's essentially what we bring, right? I, I don't want to talk too much about image format because I'm afraid to get a slap on the wrist from Chris John. Um, but we have a slightly different image format from, from the traditional OCI spec or from the, from the Docker image format. Um, what that gives us is a very nice, clean way to encapsulate the entire environment into a single file. And because of that, you can essentially, oops, you can essentially cryptographically sign it, for example. Uh, you can also take it and, and just do you know, a, a simple hash of that whole file. Another thing that's made really easy with Singularity is doing things like running with a GPU. So for example, here, uh, we have a TensorFlow container. You can just do Singularity exec minus minus GPU equals NVIDIA or minus minus GPU equals Rockham. And it will put the correct GPU or, or set of GPUs. You can, you can also, uh, soon you will be able to say, I want to take GPU 0, 1, and 4, or something like that. And those only those will appear in the container. Did my time just start? No, no. OK. <laughs> and the GPU. Mood, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, and so, so you'll be able to select what GPU you want to run with. Um, the other thing too, so we've also been working on an, uh, providing an ability so everybody with a Mac laptop, for example, can just do Singularity and it will spin up a, a small, lightweight uh, virtual machine preloaded with Singularity and it will look like you're running a Singularity container on, on your uh, laptop. So you can actually um, go and play with this. This works right now. I unfortunately don't have a link here. Um, there's also a couple other things I want to talk about. So uh, first of all, uh, for a long time in Singularity, it was only possible really to run with the set UID mode. Uh, one of the things that we've been really heavily focusing on developing recently is a completely rootless solution also to containers. Um, so right now, for the last maybe year or so, it's been possible to run completely unprivileged, rootless uh, Singularity, still taking sort of the same, um, the same paradigm of trying to take integ integration over isolation, but it's totally possible to run uh, completely unprivileged right now. Also, the other thing, we, we do support uh, network namespace isolation. We do support that only in the set UID mode. Uh, it's because we don't, we don't want to do the, the sort of the user space network stack isolate or emulation because it introduces a lot of overhead. Uh, and also recently, recently released, I think two days ago maybe, uh, we have support for the, the, the extensive UID and GID mappings that's in the recent kernels as well. So you can take advantage of that too as well. Um, and one more thing I want to talk about which is a little container image focused is we'll be supporting encrypted containers. I think I talk about that a little more in the build section. but. Around the August time frame, you'll see support for fully encrypted containers as well. That's kind of all I want to talk about. Thanks. Yep. Lucas. Thank you. Thank you. What did I do? Hi guys, uh, good morning. I'm Lucas Benedicic. I'm with the Swiss National Supercomputing Center. This is actually the outlier of the round times because Christian said single node only. This is the HPC uh, oriented runtime. Basically, Saros is uh, an OCI compliant container engine and goes uh, and it 
it is the evolution of, uh, of CSCS using several years of shifter on production uh, and it goes back our uh, our efforts on on the container uh, arena let's say go back to 2015 when singularity was starting when uh, shifter was starting and so on so um, I want to take maybe 30 seconds and go back to what was mentioned earlier uh, today and I and I took a couple of notes about that so uh, open standards were mentioned, uh, compatibility was mentioned, interoperability to enable m more use cases. All that was mentioned uh, earlier to eight, uh, today. Lowering the complexity, those are also the, let's say, the driving, uh, the driving objectives behind, uh, behind our effort, behind SARUS. And uh, I will uh, now uh, go quickly to the to the end to the last slide so I will show you the, the architecture first of all so basically what Saros does is, is to prepare um, to prepare a runtime uh, for uh, to prepare the environment the HPC environment for uh, an OCI uh, runtime in this case we are using run C so what what Saros basically does is to prepare the JSON bundle uh, connect to the ro Docker registry and prepare the environment together with the workload manager. In our case, we have a Cray with Slurm at uh, CSCS. And once this environment is ready, it basically does the fork exec that was mentioned also a couple of times with Run C. And from that point on, the OCI hooks that enable native performance on the HPC system, they take off, okay? This is the part that is taken care of by, by Sarus, and here you can plug basically your, the OCI runtime of, of your choice. You can even think about, for example, Podman here in a, in a future, okay? Um, so this is basically the idea. Because of time, of course, I will, uh, I will not go uh, too much in detail in this, uh, on this all, all these moving pieces, but for example, you ca I can tell you this uh, uh, compatibility and interoperability. The GPU hook that we are using is the official NVIDIA uh, hook, the OCI hook that is the, uh, developed by NVIDIA. This is plugged in directly. Um, the Cray file syst the Cray systems, you know, comes with the Cray MPT, so that is a proprietary implementation of the MPI stack. We are working together with Cray so that they will provide an MPI hook supporting their um, the Cray MPT stack. And uh, there are other hoods that we develop based on use cases that we have on our flagship system on PSDINT that enable different kinds of, of use cases on uh, an HPC system like, like PSDINT that traditionally, let's say, are, are using, for example, as it was mentioned earlier, you know, desktops for five days and not even uh, being able to, to access email and so on. So data science, uh, biology, uh, and so on. So quickly go back to the key differences. Um, the suitability for HPC for Sarots itself comes from the fact that it uses a single squash FS image, and this is, of course, out of the several years of experience we have with Shifter, because Shifter does exactly that. We do a loop mounter and run file system to, to have file image access. We have full uh, workload manager compatibility, and as mentioned earlier, we have native MPI support and native GCPU support. So you develop your image on your laptop with Docker, you bring that same image on the system, and the, the key libraries will be changed on runtime in order for the thing, uh, for the thing, or no, for the container image to run with uh, uh, with native uh, support. We have this pluggable vendor support, as I mentioned earlier, the OCI hooks uh, support uh, that today uses uh, Run C. Um, the container hook or the runtime hook that we are using today directly <coughs> off the shelf is the NVIDIA container hook uh, to enable access to GPUs. In terms of Docker of user experience, we also have a Docker-like CLI with the difference that Saros is just a runtime, okay? So you cannot create images with Saros. We rely on the traditional and very well-established Docker workflow here. Uh, we have, of course, Docker Hub integration. We have integration with the NVIDIA Cloud. We have integration with uh, 
private repos. Uh, we also enable uh, write, uh, writable containers with overlay FS, but in this case, we don't have overlay FS on each of the layers of the container image, but only one because it's squashed, okay, as I mentioned earlier. And we preserve the identity and file permissions. That's what we were discussing earlier with Shane. Those are the little details that still make something like Podman or, or, or Docker or rootless Docker not being fully compatible yet what an HPC multi-tenant system is about. Uh, in terms of uh, admin, so for those of you who are on the sysadmin side, this is a single executable binary, so there are no needs for servers or other kind of, uh, of network services available inside the data center. Uh, you can custo customize the OCI hooks as per service. So if you have a system that does not have GPUs, you just turn off the, the GPU hook. And uh, we provide container isolation uh, through the fork exec uh, method, as I mentioned earlier. And as far as we know, we are the only runtime uh, that provides uh, process isolation. But that's as, as far as we know. We will see. And uh, I'm looking forward to your feedback there. And uh, in terms of uh, man maintenance effort, uh, we reuse uh, run C. So basically, we don't have any, any overhead there other than the CV that was uh, published in February. Well, we had to do something about that, <laughs> yes. Uh, we reuse OCI compliance software, and this is also working for us in-house because since we finished with the runtime, we are focusing only on developing OCI hooks. Okay, so that means that whatever the let's say the container HPC um, area or the environment will move to will be OCI compliant uh, in the future, and those uh, development efforts in inside CSCS will not be lost, and that's also something important for us. And okay, we can also say that it's been very well tested. We have very good uh, unit test coverage. Okay, that's all from my side. Thank you. Now yeah, you can just stay here because okay, sure. Yeah, we we have the panel now, and um, and we need some more some more chefs. Could like uh, Valentin and yeah, another chef. Akahiro and uh, Michael, we just join. So we. Okay. <coughs> I think that's almost almost fine. Yeah, I think yeah. Bring your own chair. chair. <laughs> Question is for Lucas. Um, Lucas, oh, you sorry. said the, um, uh, the 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 runtime here is multi-node. Yes. Um, could you speak a little bit more about that? It wasn't clear to me what the multi-node component is. Okay, great. So uh, let me see. So where is the? Can you change the slide? Can you put the next slide? Yeah, great. Okay. So nineteen. No, no, no. Ah, no. okay. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so the thing is as follows. So how this works in, in practice. Uh, you're familiar with Slurm, I imagine? Okay, so what you do here is just call Sarus as, uh, as you would call any other application, okay? So you do S run Sarus, you know, and then uh, the name of the image, whether you want MPI, uh, MPI or not, and so on. So then basically the setup of the MPI, uh, of the MPI context, of the MPI communicator, you know, and the environment and so on, is left to the workload manager itself. So it's Slurm in this, ca in this case for us that takes care of that part. And that's where after that is set up here at the, uh, in the, let's say, the gray box, okay? Rancy, when the MPI hook uh, called by Rancy picks up, that environment is already available. So what we do is we basically scan, we, re we rely on this well-known by now, MPitch uh, ABI compatibility. So we scan the container image and we switch the MPI libraries so that you can actually use the Aria Singer Connect, okay? The Cray MPT. So that is how 
uh, the MPI environment works in service. Let's close. Yes. Uh, I have a question about the Saras. So, yes. uh, I. Can you speak in the, in the, like, in the, in the X? Ah, oh, okay. So, inside the container, so Saras can help to mount to the mount on the parallel file system. Is that right? Yes, so exactly. That, so, does it support any types of, of file system drivers, for example, Luster or GPFS? Yes, yes, exactly. Because it uses that's the that's the part of the of uh, of the runtime of, of Saros that still runs with the CUID zero because it uses mount, and uh, in the way that we use it at CSCS is by mounting the home directory of the user and the scratch. Okay, so those two directories are mounted inside the container, are unavailable with the same UID and GID uh, as the user that launched them. And this, again, in an HPC environment, is important not only not only because of security, but also for quota, okay, and access to resources. And that's and that's a key, uh, and that you map in from the host, you use the Unix ID and the group ID of the user. Yep. And the Engine or Saros enforces the user and group ID speed yep. the same, and then run C can pick it up. Yeah, yeah, exactly, so exactly. The kernel does the POSIX magic to make sure that there's no weird stuff going on. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, we we take care of that with uh, with a couple of things that that we do at. Uh, in the gray box part, you know, it's let's say it's an intelligent wrapper. Okay, it sets up it sets up the environment. Yeah. yeah. Cool. We yeah, had you. Uh, hi, um, my question uh, would be, um, uh, now that I, that I saw that you uh, from, from the Zaros uh, uh, um, community have, have come up with a, uh, the concept of an MPI hook, I think that that's a really great thing. Um, what we do is uh, we... Um, uh, Sorry, I will in, stand in up because I don't see you. Yeah. <laughs> what? I, I will stand up because I cannot see you. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, we support uh, a lot of commercial, especially CFD software, mm -hmm. and um, our um, experience with the ISVs is that they don't like to, uh, too much changes to, uh, to the software. So the MPI runtime is hidden between layers of, of scripting, and yeah. they, they don't like uh, us uh, tweaking yeah. uh, with that kind of stuff. And also we don't like to do it because we have to maintain it afterwards. Yeah. So um, my question would be to, to, to the others. Um, What's your perspective on, uh, on this implementing MPI hooks so that uh, we don't have to, to, to tweak the applications? Are you planning something similar? Yeah. yeah, I mean, in terms of HPC applications, I would say that, yes, that's, uh, that's the recipe that has proven, from practice, has been proven to be the, the most effective one for us so far. But is it there? My, my um, personal uh, uh, experience is that you still have uh, that, that running MPI is, is still quite painful. For example, you, you have to, to, to have to, the, the same uh, uh, version outside the container, inside the container, no. maintain it. No? No. Okay, then I'm no. outdated. No. <laughs> well, there, there are a couple of caveats, okay? okay it's then change, like yeah, yeah, please. Okay, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. There's a new microphone. Yeah, exactly. You have a mic. In. I think everybody's been doing the same trick. Is uh, it, it works? It works very well with MPitch just because their ABI compatibility layer has been, I think, the most stable. It's a little bit trickier, I think, with OpenMPI just because uh, there's a little more uh, change yeah, there. Especially but on I the think, cray, yeah. yeah. So I think if you're like at three and above, then it's it's a little bit cleaner. It's MPitch three fourteen. And I will, that that should yeah. be. Yeah. I mean, we have images that I built two two years ago that I'll still run tests mm -hmm. with and you know I haven't had to change anything. That being said, I think the the glibc changes on yep. are are now the first time we're starting to see something where it may break uh, break some compatibility. So this is a case where we need the vendors to do a little bit too because we want them to provide uh M pitch builds or MPI builds for both the glibc that's running natively on the system as well as maybe some for older glibc so we can maintain compatibility. Yeah. So the point there is, if you go and look at, um, there'll be uh, calls in the mpitch library, for example, that aren't in those older glibc um, 
libraries that may be in older images. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And hooks. I mean, I have a, a little problem with hooks and quotes. <laughs> Uh, because you change the configuration and sometimes also for GPUs, you also change the file system of the container that's running. And as a purist, that kind of hurts my soul a little bit. This, uh, yeah. this so is like, this is one of those cases where you can't, there's not, you need yeah. some interface layer, right? Yeah. And right now that's the easiest way to I mean, do it. So it does. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, all. The HPC systems usually have fallbacks, okay? They don't just break on your face. So if you don't do the hook uh, trick, let's say, or the magic, the, uh, the, the, angelic, the, the intelligent wrapping, you know, that Saros does at the beginning, things will run, but they will run slow. You will use the, 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 mm -hmm. the software stack, you know, under the, the MPI. Mm -hmm. You will not have a, probably, our acceleration, yeah. you know. It will work, but that's not why you go on an HPC system. No, no, no. All right? You stay on your laptop or you connect several laptops. And <laughs> but I would argue that we do API hooks. We do SSH hooks. Or you, I mean, you do SSH We do. Yeah. They are open. Yeah. I mean, they, all of this is open source, guys, OK? Mm -hmm. This is BSD3 uh, license uh, copyrighted by ETH Zurich. Uh, and it's on GitHub. So you can look it up. It's very but, well documented also. But you are doing this because? the legacy stuff that you are using on our sub codes or some workflows mm -hmm. like MPI, they force you to do this. Well, well exactly. Yeah. See, it, those are the aspects that make, uh, in our case, PeaceDynt, you know, the uh, running front or the, or the key differences, you know, the, for our users or our customers that make sense to bring their workflows on our system. Because otherwise, we will not be providing that. Uh, as I think as the CJ was doing that last mile, you know, that is what we are covering here. That's the gap that we are feeling. Yeah, like the SSH hook is specific, specifically, we put that in Shifter, I think, and it yeah, was exactly. because, I forget which ones, Gaussian or something like that, that's how they launched their code. And so yeah. they need to be in that container environment. So this was, you, they could do that work themselves, but just having this yeah. in there kind of makes it a little bit easier. In, in, in our case, the, uh, our users are, um, are using the SSH hook for Spark, for example, for Spark deployments. You mm. need a way to connect. To oh the, yeah, that was to, the other exactly, one. Exactly. Yeah. You yeah. see, you need a way to connect the workers uh, with the with the master of Spark inside the, that containerized environment, and you do that through the SSH hook. Yeah, I don't I don't blame you guys for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's often an HPC where we just. We need something to work, and when it works, even if it's brittle, even if it's POC, and this, I don't say that's brittle, but at the beginning in container land, I think everything was a little bit brittle. We are getting there yet, uh, but we are just trying to work around the fundamental problem that we might want to change, use PMIX. I'm a big fan of PMIX, by the way, like PMI. That would help with some of this. I'm not saying all of this, but it would help a little bit as well to ease the pain, maybe. Not for Spark, but yeah. Mm, well, but uh, I mean, in the case of HPC centers, you know, like NERSC, for example, and CSCS and, and others, uh, I'm sure there are others in the room. Um, there is, uh, sooner than later, you have to re rely on what the vendor gives you, okay, on the machine. And uh, that's where our focus and effort goes, in order to fill that gap so that users you know, don't suffer system updates or do not suffer when we change uh, drivers or we go to a newer version of the Cray Linux environment, for example, and so on. So the, the hooks, you know, and this way of uh, having as much as possible taken care by the community, like from RunC on, okay, we will keep working on the, on the gray box so that our users do not suffer the, the changes, let's say, because what, I mean, from practice, I can tell you that whenever we had uh, uh, a major upgrade on the system, people would have to go and recompile their applications. I mean, as simple as that. And if we had an upgrade on the system, you know, that was close to the Gordon Bell run, well, I cannot mention that to you, okay, what, what the consequences would be. So, so that those are things that happen. Like I said, I, I don't blame you, but I'm just... I mean, we could arm wrestle somehow the ISVs to do something better and not ship on CDs anymore and maybe be more container friendly as well. 
Yeah, I mean, well, Ben sure. has an opinion there as well because you work with a lot of ISVs. But uh, where's the box? There is the box. It says on the bottom. It says, "Don't throw it without the." Why are you <laughs> looking at it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, uh, I find um, both uh, Shifter and Saros as brilliant. By the way, um, it, it solves a very specific problem. I think what you're trying to provide is that um, highest level of um, performance on your systems, which is what your system is built for, um, and not taking away the concept of a container completely from the from the community. And I don't think you even called it containers. They were called user supplied images or user or created them, images. Yeah, it's like um, right? customized environments or something right. like that. So yeah. I think to, to go back to your point, this is all about performance at the at the peak versus portability um they, they take away a little bit of our portability yeah. but give us highest performance right and that's a very well made decision on their part a i think yeah. um, i cannot make that trade-off because i like to run my containers in the cloud and, and in various systems so portability becomes the number one factor i'm ready to give away some performance so th th that's where the that's where the difference is ISVs, I think the ISVs are most worried about support. So that's why they ship their MPI, for example, together with their code, because that's what they tested with. And they can still do that, and it'll, the, the tricks should work, um, you know, with maybe some odd caveats occasionally. Right. Right. Which I haven't seen in practice for the most part. Right. I think your point now is you're saying uh, leave the, um, the, the, the MPI service part to us we'll manage that and you you as the user bring the client components the runtime components of mpi and it should still work right. in most cases but, right and i think that's mostly my experience too no. um, but should, should the isv not like very much welcome containerization also for support reasons if like imagine we have a, a good like a, a Hello, we have our heaven built where we have a clean API that we have clean MPI integration, which is easy. Shouldn't it be much easier for an ISV to support this instead of having pre-compiled RPMs and supporting various other things? Like if we would have it containerized? The, the problem that ISVs face is very, very simple. If they can't replicate the problem you are facing as a user during runtime, they cannot help you. Yeah. I mean... It, the, I think the containerization does help because at least everything except for the parts that have to be injected right. are the same, right? right? And you could, I think, start to have your cake and eat it too in that it, a lot of these, it's a, you can decide what gets swapped in, right? So you could have, if you wanted to have builds of those different MPI distros, you know, on the system, you could say, like, I want to run this container with this, you know, this MPI distro in it. Um, you know, we haven't experimented with that too much ourselves, but it would be possible uh, to the extent that it interplays with the interconnect that's on the system. Yeah. And Christian, can I ask my own quick question? Um, can we use uh, Saro's shifter? Um, outside of the Cray ecosystem, um, oh, it, it, oh, it, it, is definitely this can run it. All, it does. It's not a Cray specific thing. No, it's, it's yeah. not Cray specific. No. Yeah. I mean, we we do have, for example, we we work uh, closely together with Posi, uh, and. Uh, they have it running on, on clusters. Okay, they also have a Cray, but we also have uh, at CSCS, uh, we also have it running on, on Linux clusters, and no problem. Yeah. I would say the way, because of the way shifters are architected, because there's a gateway component, uh, it's a little, it doesn't make as much sense outside of a clustered environment for the most part. Um, you know, I think these more single binary kind of approaches like source or singularity are a little bit easier in that regard. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, I have a question on the architecture of Podman. Uh, could you please? Uh, describe uh, a bit more in detail in which format the images uh, are stored and uh, where they live at runtime. So, can you hear me? 
All right. So the the architecture from the storage backend is very similar to the one of of Docker. At the beginning, the storage backend was basically a a fork of Docker, and then extended uh, to support the architecture of Portman. Portman is not a demon. So when it comes to synchronization, this is really painful because we can't use just memory mutexes, right? We have to synchronize on a file system, so we had to extend everything in the storage backend as well. So it's stored, depending if you run root or rootless, it's stored at different places. Necessarily, when you're non-root, it will be stored in your home, or you can configure it to be stored at any place you want to, but it must be readable and writable for your user. Um, Everything is centrally configurable in uh, config files. They're different for rootless and root for sure. Um, Do you need some support? Just pull up a random presentation here. Okay. Uh, well, maybe, maybe, maybe not. There's, there's so many, so many <laughs> presentations at the moment. Um, but in the end, all layers are stored or exploded on the file system, right? And then it depends at runtime which storage backend you're using. It could be overlay, it could be butterfs, it could be vfs. Vfs, for instance, is the the simplest one because every layer is basically just stored in a separate folder or basically a separate tar file and then they're mounted over another to then have uh, the image in the end for union file systems uh, they're basically overlaying like uh, overlayfs or also butterf butterfs are doing does that answer your question thanks you're welcome and just maybe as a follow-up um the how do you guys see i mean i'm always a big fan of because i'm a purist i guess i'm always a big fan of read only containers i mean you someone talked about i think it was you michael right you talked about that you also support a read write layer should we just forbid this <laughs> why, why 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 do we need to to do this i mean why <laughs> Sorry, th things break otherwise. You know, some um, many uh, containerized applications and environments rely on the fact that they can actually save something. You know, like I don't know, a socket. You know, uh, a run file configuration. You know, yeah. things that they need to keep track and runtime. That if you don't have a, a writable uh, container, they just break. But they could they could yeah, yeah, the application break, yeah. yes, yes, but exactly. But they use a volume instead of an overlaying file system, right? And sometimes you don't need it. Them, right? Yeah. You're just writing some random temporary data, and you mm -hmm. don't want to have to go and hunt down a different version or a fork of the application. So if you give it, I mean, like in Singularity, when you give it a, an overlay, it gives you like a small tempfs that sits on top. But the overlay allows for the whole container file system to be changed, right? I would rather have a read-only file, uh, container file system and then say, if you want to change something in slash var lib whatever, then create a volume that is that is. But then it's then it's persisting on the host, right? With the volume. No, but it will be moved when the if it's just a volume that is attached to the container, it will be removed once the container yeah. is gone. I I think I agree with you that as a practice, we should encourage when people are designing their images, design them to be as read-only as possible and try to put the configuration in some kind of controllable space so that it's. But yeah, and you come across you'll. You'll pick up Spark or something like that, yep. and it'll say like, "Oh, exactly. I'm going to sit there and yeah. you know twiddle something in Etsy," yeah. and then you you have to work around yeah. that. Um, yeah. so CJ. There's some cases where. It <coughs> box. Box. Does, Does he see it coming? <laughs> Thanks. There's some cases where, uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit later where. You have to ask how is it that you're going to solve certain problems, and one of the prob one of the ways to solve the problem is to modify your image once you're there. Such as uh, you may have multiple binaries inside the container, and you may wish to fix up some paths or move things around. That's an example. Uh, or you may wish to make sure that what is in the container and loaded inside the container matches what's on the host system, where you have essentially a fixed container that you're distributing and you're wanting to work in lots of different environments. And so 
those are some areas where uh, we found it useful so far as pragmatic and we think reasonably safe to be able to make modifications to that image. Um, so that's not to say that's the only way to solve those things, mm -hmm. right? You can do things with multiple entry points, for example, but not everybody supports multiple entry points. And that's kind of, it can be fraught with peril. So uh, we as a community probably, probably had to enumerate those different reasons of why would people want to mess with their containers anyway? And what are the best practices and how does that work across these variety of this variety of uh, container runtimes? I think ultimately those things, or ideally, my, my big w wish would be all these things should be solved on the OCI level. So we all have standards. So I can't really talk much from the APC, uh, HPC side because I'm not working in HPC. But this is a common thing. People and users and customers need to modify things. They have all their special needs. And one thing that bubbled into Podman from the former Atomic project is um, a concept I like pretty, or I like a lot, and it's not advertised much, that's why I want to say it here, in this, especially in this context, it's called Podman Run Label. So uh, on the CLI level, it's a command, Podman Run Label. What it will do is it will scan the image config for a label called Run Label and it will execute the command which is specified there. For sure, for sure, we should not do this at all for a random image from the web, but nobody should execute random stuff from the web in any case. But what is this can... analogous to multiple entry points? No, no, it's not multiple entry points. But what it does is, what you can basically do, you can re-execute Portman and specify exactly how you want this image to be executed. So it, you could also, in theory, the, execute the any command command line on the command line. Yes. Okay. So it will re-execute basically Portman. You can execute also any or arbitrary commands, which has its warts for sure. But what I like is it lifts the image from describing how the runtime should execute it. For instance, run C to how the container engine should interpret it. And this is something I really like, and it somehow shows also the limits of the current image formats, maybe Docker or maybe the OCI image format. We cannot specify everything we need. And sometimes, um, for instance, mounting a volume is something conditional. It depends on the state of the host. And this is something I really, I really like about this run label concept because it as i said before it shifts the image from interpreting it only by the runtime to the container engine and, uh, I'm just uh, and this this label thing you you have then the metadata you have different metadata depending on what label you execute is it like sounds like that so you have like the normally you have the manifest that incorporates the overlay file, also the layers. So you have right. the, the real meat, and then you have metadata that tr tells you how to execute it. And what you just described is that you have multiple of those metadata blobs that can be associated with different labels, and depending on what label you use, <laughs> no, how, how is it done there? Um, it's, a, it's a bit different. So it's basically just one label in the image, right? We can add arbitrary uh, metadata to the image config, and there it's basically an annotation in in the label where you can say uh, I, I think I sort of it's almost like you're embedding a, right, you a, a snippet of a compose file into the la uh, a, a label inside the image so you could see how it's intended to be run yes yeah. yes so kind of clever um, as I said in theory arbitrary commands can be executed so when your image or your container yeah, requires kind of some commands to be executed before you can run the container. This is something you can do with it. Ah, okay. So you say, okay, that's my warm-up command, and then this will be executed first, and then, okay. So you have a multi-stage entry point. Oh, no, maybe, maybe it's, that's not it, right. It's running on the host. It's, yeah. it's running on the host. So this is basically or s s certainly a security concern. But if you run it in your own environments, it's very, very, very nice. Um, Valentin, um, the, the question I have here is, aren't we then assuming that we have um, intimate knowledge of the host at the time of creating the container? 
So if we don't know what the host is going to be, then it is very difficult to write this label because we don't know what to expect from the host. So exactly. how do we resolve that? I, I don't think there's a solution because it's a very specialized feature and this is so specialized that we cannot generalize it. Mm -hmm. but, but it's useful in this example, you can sort of see like, knowing that you need to pass the privilege flag for, for this step. That's something that is not host specific. It's just when you're running it, it needs those extra things, right? right. So it's useful for those kind of things, yeah. And maybe then, uh, maybe then the container just failing and exiting, if it cannot do that, mm -hmm. it may be useful, right? Yeah. So yeah. Then, then the administrator can say, oh, okay, I can't run this container image on this host. So rather than the features failing later, it fails at startup time. So I, I do see mm -hmm. I do see that as valuable. So one one use case that um, I saw um, was uh, so before working at Red Hat, I was working at SUSE, and there's uh, the Open SUSE Cubic project, which is a really really nice containerized project or so distribution uh, with the sole purpose, at least at that time. Um, to have a container host, container distribution with Kubernetes on top. And what I always, what I never liked is the complexity of configuration systems. May it be Ansible or may it be Salt <clears throat> in the SUSE domain, it's, uh, I, I find it very painful to read. I find it hard to debug. And many things when it comes up to deploying a new node or the host, things can break everywhere. And the container guys always, so it, it, the communication needs to cross span teams. So whenever a condition or requirement of the container execution changes, well, we also have to change the config management. What I like here is we can embed everything in the container image. So whenever we would deploy or set up a new node, we in any case would pull the image from a registry we trust. So we need the keys there, they or the credential uh, credentials at least. So it's basically from a security point of view, nothing would change in comparison to before. But what I would, uh, what I loved here is that, for instance, we can have a setup container image that, for instance, starts executing cryo. Right? You, we can mount everything in the host. Uh, for sure, there's no big isolation anymore. But we can have a self-deploying Kubernetes container just by using the run label image. I'm not sure if it has been implemented yet, like this, but the. It works from a technical perspective, at least. And I found this really cool because whenever th something changes or the config changes or cryo would change, we just change the run label, we rebuild the image, we push it to the registry, and for the next deployments, everything will work. When's the time slot in? Oh, 20 minutes left. Oh, good. OK. Because so, <clears throat> I was wanting to kind of pose the question and then both to the panel and to the audience about you know, sort of what an ideal uh, container, HPC container runtime provides, right, in, in your mind. So I was thinking about this for ourselves. This is what motivated us when we first did Shifter, and it was similar things, I think, for Singularity and, and Saurus. So, um, you know, one where we were always concerned about security, so we wanted to make sure users didn't have any, any more privilege than they already had on the system, right? Um, Scalability is certainly typically important in HPC environments because uh, you know that's the type of applications you're running. So that scalability, both in terms of startup and launch, as well as the applications themselves, right? Um, another one would be um, what was the other one that I had? Oh, integration with um, other pieces of the system, specifically the resource manager. So interplaying with the resource manager cleanly. Um, and then there's, you know, so those are like really important because it's, it's fundamental to the environments that we're running in. And then there's kind of other things that like ideally it would be, you know, standards compliant. It would, you know, kind of interoperate well with things outside the HPC ecosystem because we want to leverage as much of that as we can. Another one would be, um, and this is where I think we're we're getting closer, but we're not quite there. It's like the the runtime itself requires as little privilege as possible, right? You know, so today at least with you know with Shifter, we're still relying on set UID just for some of the ways that 
in order to tackle the other goals, we're having to, you know, do that. But ideally, it'd be like it's an unprivileged thing. A user could install it if they wanted to. That's that would be the ultimate test. I mean, are there other um, features or characteristics that people would add to that list? Are there any that you guys can think of? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, part of just following on your interoperability thing, one of the things that, from a vendor perspective, I think we would uh, be interested in, and this is part of what we were talking about mm. last night, is uh, we think that we would like to be able to float lots of boats, and given that there's a variety of different container technologies that are out there. Uh, and we want to be able to, uh, as we innovate or change sort of what it is that we think needs to be done inside of a container, for example, so our way in NVIDIA of being able to enable Docker, Singularity, Shifter, or whatever, is that we want certain things to be loaded into or um, uh, bind mounted into the image, etc., or environment variables to be set and the like. And so we have... A standard mechanism, uh, I'll talk about this some this afternoon, that uh, we're seeking to enable everybody with, but we want to, uh, the, the principal answer to this is, we'd like to be able to write one thing yeah. that can be semi-standard and that everybody else can use, and that we think that it's reasonable also that other vendors ought to be able to provide the same thing with the same kind of interface uh, in yeah. this way. That makes sense. Um, and so figuring out what's that minimal set, how do we make that, how do we do that, how do we work the issues of, well, is that kind of a little extra special privilege relative to what other Joe random person might be wanting to do in terms of should you really be allowed to copy things in or do bind mounts or have more than a, a fixed schedule of things that you're allowed to do or whatever? And sort of how do you trust that without having to hard code that separately for each one? So there's interoperability with sort of, but also for the vendors and upstream providers that it's easy for them to kind of integrate with these exactly. as well, right? Yeah. But uh, that's your your problem space is a little bit different than what uh, what what, um, what Lucas and and uh, Chen Chen It's are complementary, facing, right? right? Because. I, I would say I would reckon or my that's would be like discussion point is that you try to fix something that works for everyone right because you don't have the embedded administrators at the at the customer's uh, side right and and for you it's different because you have this five things or five clusters you need to care about and of course this is the big biggest one is the most important one and you want to fix this and the rest is just like okay. yeah well exactly as infrastructure service providers you know i mean it's, it's a part of our nature you know to blame it on the vendor you know because <laughs> they are always the bad guys but i mean Good from the thick skin yeah exactly so but from the vendor point of view it makes total sense i mean if you have to support every single runtime out there you know for uh, in order to to access gpus then i mean well yeah whether this, that is is the right way or not that's why we that was one of the main reasons why we moved to oci compatibility for example okay mm -hmm. we kind of saw that is that is the way to go okay uh, fortunately you know then the community followed because we could it was a bet back in the day i mean and and you, know. Wilson, you brought that up before too we absolutely thumbs up to we should figure out how to what the oci spec already covers and whether we need to extend the OCI spec in some particular ways to be useful or whether something belongs in something other than OCI, but I totally agree that we should move towards standardization for those things. Yeah. Um, let me just make one more comment, and I'll, I'll talk about this more this afternoon again too, but we recognize too that uh, when we have, let's just say, things that helpful things that we can do, uh, it's helpful, but it's helpful for a particular context. And one of the things that Shane was pointing out last night is that uh, we may want to say, here's what you do if there's no scheduler and you want to make sure that all the resources also appropriately get exposed. But mm. if you have a resource manager that's already managing that for you, please stay out of my way yeah. and don't do things that I have to undo or prevent do or throw away your stuff because I don't want that or whatever. So yeah. we need to have an appropriate dialogue uh, with users and the uh, schedulers and orchestrators also to understand sort of insofar as we would want to do things how do we need to make that parameterized so that we can say here are the things you know here's the standard things that should be done at, at startup right and part of that run hook or whatever uh to be able to do that yeah 
Oh, just one after. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. Okay, I have just one question to the whole panel about um, the life cycle management of a whole image and application. So in general, you try starting development on a laptop with Docker or something like this for the uh, containers, put it to the first cluster, then run it there, say, okay, it's fine, and then move it to others. And then you may recognize, oh, it's not performing. So in general, you would say, okay, I, lay, I took something like Intel Parallel Studio or Crypad or something like that that really costs lots of money and that you don't have on your laptop. That's impossible. So how do you do, deal with this kind of problems? And the other one is um, the images, I think, make everything more like a consumable, like apps on your, on your smartphone. But from my point of view, you, or the whole HPC community risk that we we'll just throw away some portion of uh, performance because we don't recognize that systems are different and in the future they are, will be more different and specialized and you're, you're not really able to, to recognize all of them. So how do you confirm or convince the people that it's not enough to work on a laptop with, or on a desktop system to analyze everything um, and then scale up two, three, four magnitudes for a higher problem than where you have 30% utilization or even 3% utilization. But well, we should keep it in the runtime. That's more like... The it's getting closer to the image to build the stuff. Is where to, I mean, okay, yes, can, can, can yeah. we talk a little bit about, about image building, though? Because, I, I mean, one thing that, that we're trying to build with, with this build service of ours is to give users the ability to build on, like, custom, you know, hardware architecture set up that only the cluster has access to. So spin up a VM in that specific context with the right tools available to build an image optimized for the cluster rather than to build the image on your laptop, right? And, and like you said, you know, Docker is great for going and prototyping uh, and trying things out and iterating really, really quickly. Uh, but then when you want to go and build that, that final optimized image that will scale, we're trying to now create that service to help people you know, do those builds in the right context so that they're actually gonna perf be performant uh, on the system. And then I also think there's, there's room to sort of, in some ways, tie metadata to the image that describes the optimal conditions for the image to be run with. Um, and so we're, doing, we're also doing work, uh, so right now on, on the library, every time you upload an image, it's already now telling you what architecture it was built for, whether it's uh, you know AMD 64, PowerPC, or whatever it is. It'll describe that, and we're we're trying to sort of take that concept a step further as well. I I think just to you know sort of answer your question about in practice, here's what I tell our users. I say like you know pack as much of you can in that image that you know is sort of fixed. All your dependencies, you know, put those in the image, and then um. To iterate, <laughs> drop into that environment, and if you have to, keep your application still in, you know, in, a, in the disk, in the file system, in the global file system, right? Home or Scratch or something like that. And you do your iteration there, and then as you sort of get to like, okay, now I've got something that's functional, you go fold that back into the image. It can be a little bit clunky, and I think as we get to um, unprivileged builds on the system, that would greatly simplify things. But right now, it's sort of as a workflow, that's kind of the process that I typically use. But this, and uh, being a devil's advocate again, but this is like, if everyone would adopt the CICD and the workflow that is used in normal software environment where you check in every change, but I get that's more... If you even in a real CICD, people are still doing stuff iteratively yeah, on their yeah, laptop. Yeah. It's just, that's a myth if it's like, oh, I know exactly what to do, and then it, oh, it passed tests, so now it's all, you know, it's, sometimes you have to play around with things, and I think that's where the disconnect happens, but, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. From from our perspective, you know, at CSCS, and I'm being on, working with containers for so many years, the diversity of hardware and software, you know, is such that we don't even target, you know, covering all the cases, but rather falling back in a nice way. So your container will run, maybe not with the highest possible performance, okay, but it will run. And that's where you lower the bar already. 
because the user is not finding an error message you know that is hard to decrypt but the thing actually runs is deployed on multiple nodes and off it goes now once the user gets comfortable with the way the the, the his or her container is running on multiple nodes or, or on a system on top of which it was not built, then you can start thinking about performance. Because we also found, and, and in, in our cases, users that were, I think you mentioned that, are willing to drop, you know, to not go 100% utilization, okay? That brings accounting issues and so on, you go that, that are different, you know, and maybe out of the scope of it's their allocation, of this, if that's uh, exactly you know, of okay this workshop. It. <laughs> but it's perfectly fine for uh, for many use cases out there to scale up on more nodes and not use them uh, optimally. Let's say. So I think that the key uh, for for HPC centers is to have this graceful feedback. Okay, so it will not run using the hardware acceleration, all the GPUs, you know, the, the, I don't know, the Aries interconnect in our case or whatever, or InfiniBand, but it will work. I think that's the key, and I think that's the first thing that we should aim to, because we still have several users and use cases bringing stuff to our system that they just fail. Error, you know, I just cannot launch. And just lowering the bar of entry. And for your yeah. exactly. systems which are not performing anyway, so you don't care if it's, if it's 9% yeah, exactly. or 8% yeah. CPU utilization. Exactly. Right? Exactly. I mean, I mean, we certainly, when we started looking at containers, the number one reason we were looking at them was for kind of productivity. It's like mm -hmm. if somebody had an application and it's just really difficult to get deployed on a SUSE-based system or something like that, uh, you know, they could they could get it going. And it was, you know, after we kind of felt like that was maybe not completely solved, but at least it was better, then it, we started thinking about like, well, what about performance? And you know, that's still, a, I think, a work in progress, but we definitely have practice, like, if you do this and this, you can probably get pretty good performance. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, we, when we talk about image building, we'll probably talk about compilers and stuff like that, too, which is another wrinkle. Questions for Shane. Um, I know you had some accidental benefits of, mm -hmm. of Shifter. Right. Can you touch on that a little bit? It, it wasn't just for compatibility reasons. You also found real good performance reasons yeah. that containers and imaging can help you. Yeah, and this is, I think, um, mainly due to the way we, and it's, it's all being used on all of these, actually, where we squash the file system, then we mount it up on the nodes. And so the benefit there was in a lot of, especially like Python applications were not notorious for this because they have to do so much metadata access to kind of build up their namespace. And if everything's back on a parallel file system, then that's all metadata access back to the meta, you know, on the parallel file system, which is the worst part of the system, right? So, um, you know, that's that scalability piece, uh, scalable launch. And I think that that's still, uh, you know, a key one that as, you know, things like Podman, I think, are really cool. I'm glad to see where, I think, like, slowly we're chipping away at the reasons we had to make a custom runtime. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, there's a few tricks that we've adopted here, and we have to figure out, like, how could we fold those back into the, to the general ecosystem would be useful. I also think, um, I mean, this is maybe more just like containerization in general, um, but but on a system, you know, it's really hard for the administrator to install the most optimized version of whatever, you know, TensorFlow or whatever mm -hmm. application they're using. And I think we see a lot of performance increase just from the fact that the user is able to download the right version of the software that they right. want and, and use it. I mean, I mean, it's a, it's a real thing. You see yeah, speed up over expert bare metal. One can go build this thing and now everybody can get the advantage it, of it, it, right? Exactly. And yeah. so, you know, there's there's some benchmark, um, you know, in papers or whatever, comparing, you know, Docker, Singularity, bare metal, and both Docker and Singularity are usually a little bit better than bare metal, just for the fact that they, you know, they couldn't get whatever most optimized version of their software installed in the first place. And that, you know, just from that perspective, it's already really nice for performance, right? We have five minutes left, by the way. So then we have a coffee break. And after we talk about build, but I think it was good that we had a lot of time like talking in this first segment uh, and then have a panel that is more longer than expected, which is always good. Yeah. <laughs> Abdul.
Uh, one last question to uh, maybe Lucas and also Shane. What are the limitations? Because, for example, there was a question here about the MPI compatibility uh -huh. between the container and the host. I know that it works fine with MPI, Open MPI 3.xx, yeah. but if you are stuck with a system that it is less than that, is this problem still remaining that you need to have compatibility between the uh, MPI inside the container and the host, or there is a solution? And also to Locus, what are the limitations of Cirrus? Uh, sh should everyone just go for it? Uh, for example, in Prace, in HPC in Europe, should we encourage all of the HPC clusters, uh, centers to just install it? What are the limitations? If there are, I would like to hear about that. Are you going to say no? Or, uh, yeah. no. Um, I'm going to question. Well, okay, so for the first one, okay, for the MPI thing. So you mentioned if you are stuck with an MPI on the system, you mean the whole system, I imagine, I assuming. So there, basically, you... Is, is where the, the gray box, if you remember the architecture diagram, is, that's where the, uh, the gray box actually uh, is doing the work, okay? So the gray box is uh, preparing the environment and filling the gaps from whatever comes into the container towards the, the host system. In our case, because Cray MPT is based on MPH, we can play the, uh, the MPI ABI compatibility card. Now, should our whole system had uh, open MPI, uh, you know, as the um, as the host accelerated uh, MPI? I don't know who, how would that work. I really, I have to say, you know, from from the heart, I don't know, because uh, we haven't uh, we haven't tested with uh, with open MPI on the host. Uh, in any of the system, any, any of the clusters that we have. We have MBAPIS2, we have Intel MPI, um, okay, Cray, Cray MPI, of course, uh, even Vanilla MPH uh, on top of InfiniBan and other things, uh, they all work. We also have the other, the other aspect of the thing, so open MPI inside the container and then make it run on an MPH, let's say, accelerated uh, host. I can comment on all those cases, but uh, the other one, I don't know. And regarding your second question, well, uh, I guess uh, you should try it out. And if it works for you, uh, uh, we will be very happy not only to help you, but you know, to, uh, to take into contributions, because that's why we open source it, OK? So I imagine you know, that uh, people will be able to deploy or develop uh, hooks that will fill this little gap, you know, from the container towards their, uh, their whole system. Well, um, maybe one last, but then we have to... Yeah. One last selfish question that I, I want to ask. The Sarah system, is it like a single project or do you have plugins for all the different things? So if how extensible is it from the get-go? So you're talking about the gray box? Yeah, the gray box. Is yeah, so the gray, gray box, box is a single is a single binary, okay? Uh. It's configurable from the from the point of view of the sysadmin and uh, it's extensible, you know, as it's uh, Fortran, I guess. No, no, it's C plus plus eleven. C plus plus eleven. C plus plus eleven. Yeah. Why yeah. not go? Um, I was I'd ask that too. I don't know. I, yeah. I really don't know why. Uh, I guess because our in in house expertise is more on the C plus plus side. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah you know, but yeah. just to circle back to the question, I think um, yeah, we're the container is just a. You know, it just is a kind of a byproduct here. Really, what we're it, we're taking advantage of is the ABI compatibility in these things, and you know, just it's just how good of a job have the MPI distros done in kind of adhering to that. Um, I think what would be useful is eventually we might find that as we move more towards containers, the way we do those abstractions maybe needs to change a little bit, and there might be another way that is cleaner that would make it easier to take different MPI distributions and then layer them on top. So that could be something like LibFabrics or something. LibFabrics, I mean, exactly. Yeah. That's one of the things but, we are working on. Yeah. But because we're not that, there yeah. yet, I would say. The main issue here is portability. Yeah. Because, right. yeah, Ceres works well for your cluster, but how it will work well on the other people's clusters. Of course, we will give it a try and, uh, and, and embrace and, and get some people to test it and this is the way 
but portability is a very important issue when you look in a yep. large scale. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And in this, we have this ECP project that we're working on, and one of the main things we're going to be looking at is trying to demonstrate how to best practices for image portability. Okay, we need to have the break, um, and then we will be back after at 11.30 and talk about build. And this was just the first cake layer, right? So the cherries are on the very top, so it's just the foundation. Um, by the way, there is a, a paper for Cirrus uh, in, in our uh, repository. If people want to get a look at it, we will post it on Slack so you can look at the Cirrus paper.